Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk to you about some classic works of nonfiction. When someone says the classics, most of us immediately think of classic works of literature, meaning fiction. But when you sit down and think about it, there are a whole lot of nonfiction books out there that could qualify as classics as well. Books that have influenced society, books that have launched new subgenres within nonfiction, and books that have legacies that extend into the modern day. I've composed a list of 10 such books, and I thought I would chat about them with you in today's video. So let's start off with what is probably one of the most famous books of all time, The Diary of Anne Frank. You have very likely already read this book. If you haven't read it, then you probably have at least heard of it. But this was a book that was written by a Dutch-German girl of Jewish origin. She was gifted a diary by her family in 1942. She started writing in it shortly thereafter, and she continued writing in it through the period when her family was in hiding from the Nazis in a secret annex. Unfortunately, Anne did not survive the war, but her father, Otto Frank, did. A couple of people who were helping out the family when they were in hiding in the secret annex kept all of Anne's writings, I guess in the hopes that someday someone would come to claim them. And eventually Anne's father did. And the writings in her diary, as well as the writings in various other notebooks that she wrote in, all of those things now make up what we know as the Diary of Anne Frank. This is a book that is still being widely read, widely studied, even today, especially within the context of Holocaust studies. I was not required to read this one in school. We read Night by Lee Wiesel instead. But this was one that I put on my own required reading list after I graduated from college, trying to fill in all the gaps that I thought were there because I thought when I made that list, and I still think today, that this one is absolutely essential reading. Another classic work of nonfiction that you have very likely heard of, if not read, is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. This book was published in 1936. And it is probably the single most famous self-help book out there. It was written by a public speaking teacher. He would travel from place to place giving courses on public speaking. And they were so popular that a publisher actually approached him and asked him if he would like to put all of the ideas from his courses into a book. And after some initial reluctance, that is exactly what Carnegie did. He wrote in his book about simple steps you can take to make people like you more, such as smiling more often, not criticizing others, taking an interest in other people's interests. He also wrote about how you can be more persuasive and how you can be a leader. It is basically a guidebook for successful interaction. And while modern readers may find its contents a little bit too simple, kind of obvious and straightforward, I would argue that simple things are the things that are most easily forgotten, most easily brushed to the side when more complex things come into our field of vision. So I personally think it's good to have books like this out there. And I guess a whole lot of other people agree with me on that because it's one of the best selling books of all time. The next classic work of nonfiction is said to have launched the environmentalism movement. That's of course, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. This book came out in 1962, and when it did, it caused an uproar. It is basically a book-length expose of just how many chemicals, namely pesticides, Americans were pouring into the environment without any awareness of or regard to what the consequences of those actions were likely to be. The book is called Silent Spring because right at the beginning of the book, Rachel Carson envisions a very sad future where the return of spring doesn't mean the return of birds and their bird song. It means silence. And she had a reason to fear this because there was a pesticide that was being sprayed literally everywhere called DDT. Birds were consuming this and it was causing the shells of their eggs to thin and therefore their embryos were not able to survive. Bird numbers were dropping drastically. After this book was published, people demanded a change. They did not want to see that silent spring become a reality. And as a result, DDT was very thankfully banned. And I think after reading this book, a lot of people looked a little bit more closely at their own relationship with the environment when they previously may have not. A lot of the information in this book is a little bit outdated since DDT is no longer in use. But I will say so many of her points in this book are just as relevant today. 
Another foundational work of nonfiction is The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. This book was published in a very significant year, 1776, and anyone who's taken an economics course, like myself, will very likely be familiar with this one. If you've taken an economics course, then you will likely know that in this book, Adam Smith argues against the mercantilist system that was predominant during the time. And that's basically just a fancy way of saying that he was arguing against the use of taxes and tariffs, and he was arguing for for free trade. He also introduces the concept of the invisible hand and division of labor in this book, two things that we still talk about in modern economics. Like I said before, this is a book that literally every single student of economics will either read or at least learn the concepts from. It is that important. There have of course been books published after this one that have built upon his ideas, such as David Ricardo's Theory of Comparative Advantage in 1817, but this book, The Wealth of Nations, will always be the seminal work of modern economics. A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf is another book that I would consider to be a classic work of nonfiction. It was published in 1929, and it's actually an extended essay that makes the argument that a woman needs her own space and her own money in order to be able to have the freedom to write. In the essay, Virginia Woolf imagines that the famous playwright William Shakespeare had a sister with equal amounts of talent, intellect, and potential, but who would have not been given the same opportunities to be creative because she was a woman. It's a work that insists that women should have a seat at the table when it comes to writing fiction. And because of that reason, it is considered a classic feminist text. Next up is a book that many people believe to be one of the first, if not the first work of true crime. It's In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. The story behind this book is that Truman Capote and his childhood friend Harper Lee, author of To Kill a Mockingbird, traveled to Kansas after they heard about four murders that took place in a small farming town. They interviewed people attached to the case while they were there. They even talked to the killers. And Truman Capote wrote a whole book about it that was published in 1966. Capote liked to refer to this book as the first nonfiction novel, which is not a label I've ever particularly liked. I much prefer to say something is narrative nonfiction when you're talking about nonfiction that reads like fiction. It reads like a story. But no matter what you call it, Capote wasn't really correct in his claim. There were plenty of other books that had experimented with that style before. But regardless, this book was an instant hit, and it is still one of the all-time best-selling works of true crime. Another classic work of nonfiction that was written from a first-hand experience is Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. This was written by an American journalist who was on assignment in Petrograd, which is now back to its original name of St. Peter's when the October Revolution happened in 1917. This book is his thrilling account of the revolution, and he really was in the thick of it. He was not standing on the sidelines. This man met both Lenin and Trotsky. This book was turned into a movie by the incredibly important, influential Soviet director Sergei Eisenstein. Orson Welles narrated a television program by the same name in the 60s, and just overall the name of this book has become synonymous with the Russian Revolution. And speaking Speaking of the 60s, the next classic on this list was published in 1963. It's The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. This book is technically an essay collection because it's made up of two different essays. The first one is a letter that Baldwin writes to his 14-year-old nephew discussing the history of race relations in America. And the second essay is the longer of the two, and it focuses on the relationship between race and religion. This is a book that not only played a role and had a message during the civil rights movement, but its influence has extended far beyond that. In fact, the 2015 book, the very widely read Between the World and Me by ta Coates, was meant as a modernized version of the first essay in this collection, except that Coates was writing it to his son and not his nephew, as Baldwin did. Next, while Silent Spring may be pretty up there when we're talking about science books that have had the greatest impact on the world, there have been none more influential than On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. In this book, he introduces the highly influential but highly controversial theory of evolution by means of natural selection. It's a theory that he started to develop when he noticed that finches on the Galapagos Islands that he was studying had each developed different characteristics that somehow perfectly 
perfectly suited their environments. When he presented this theory, it was not exactly warmly received by his contemporaries in the Victorian era, largely because of the way it challenged and continues to challenge religion, and it's still a controversial topic to this day, in some countries more than others. We started this list with one famous diary, so I figured it made the most sense to also end this list with another famous diary, The Diary of Samuel Pepys. This is a book, of course, made up of diary entries written by Samuel Pepys, who was a Navy administrator and a member of Parliament. He kept a diary for 10 years when he was a young man in 17th century Restoration England. It's a very important text because he was an eyewitness to really big historical events like the Great Fire of London and the plague. He was also in his diary extremely detailed about his daily life, which gives us modern readers a window into what life was like during that time period. He also wrote this diary with the intention that while none of his contemporaries would read it, future generations might read it. And because of that, he is intensely candid. So not only is this a classic, not only is it very important, historically speaking, but it is also highly entertaining. So those were 10 examples of classic works of nonfiction. I would love to hear from you in the comments below if you've read or recommend any of the books in this video, but I would also love to hear from you if you have any additional examples. This was definitely not a comprehensive list. I know there are plenty of more books out there that could qualify as classic nonfiction, and if you have any specifically that you would like to bring to my attention, please put them in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I will see you in the the next video. Bye.